the first thing I always have to answer when I say, what's it like to take the baton from John Maxwell and now own the companies that he started? It starts with the founder having a bigger picture, a bigger vision than him or herself. Don't miss that, all of you listening to this podcast. Some of you are considering succession. Some of you want to succeed. You want to work yourself out of a job. You've got to have a bigger vision than your benefit for it to work. So really, as successful, and we're having a lot of success here, as successful as this succession has happened, it starts with the person who founded it, the person who's leading it, the person who's grown it, being bigger than him or herself and seeing legacy and something bigger as the key objective. And too many successions, too many transitions doesn't work because the the preceding leader, the founder, the current leader won't give up because they still want to be in charge and and be the go-to. This is the Business of Advice podcast, where we help good advisors become great business owners. Today is going to be an incredible episode. Very excited to have uh, someone who's become a really good friend of both myself and Advisors Excel over the past few years and added a ton of value to us as an organization and to our advisors when it comes to uh, really leadership. But we're also going to have some interesting conversations around uh, succession today also. So joined today by Mark Cole, who was the CEO, but is now the owner of of the John Maxwell Enterprise and has over 25 years of leadership and team development experience. Mark, buddy, it is good to see you. This is second time in a week we've actually been together. So excited to have you on the Business of Advice podcast. Hey, good to be here. And yeah, it's two times this week. I'm just looking (laughs) at what we're going to do next week. If you want to take a vacation, just let me know I'm there, man. It it is good to be with you. Yeah, and I really appreciate, you know, I, I we met a few years ago. We came to the uh, exchange event in Nashville and got a chance to spend some time. And then uh, you and John have done a lot with our group this year, some private mentoring in that. So just added so much wisdom behind the scenes. Now I'm excited to be able to share this with a few more people. So it's going to be a, a lot of fun topics we're going to hit. But let me start here. So you, you were for a long time the CEO of John Maxwell Companies, but now are the owner. So you've actually purchased that company from John. Uh, just walk everyone through maybe your journey. How'd, how'd you end up there? And, and then we'll probably jump into what that you know, transition has been like a little bit also. Yeah, and, and let me say this. Anytime that I get invited to an audience that is following someone like yourself, Cody, first I have to say why I come. And I come because every time I talk to Cody, I get something as a dad that makes me better when I go home. I get something as a business leader that makes me go run a business better. And I give something that makes me hungry to be a greater leader. Mm -hmm. So, Cody, I really am honored to be here today. And then that you would invite me in with some of the greats you've had on this podcast. I'm really humbled to be here. And podcast audience, I really hope to do what Cody does episode in, episode out. And that is add value to you today. Because that's what happens to me, going back to the story, the question that you asked. Man, I started in in John Maxwell's organization in the year 2000, Hmm. and I was an entry-level telesales representative. And yes, that title was long to sound better than the actual grind of the position, which was to (laughs) put butts in seats. That was my job description. Get people to say yes. And uh, I was 30 years old, Cody. I was doing a restart. I love to tell the story that, I mean, just three weeks, four weeks before I started John's company, started with John's company, which was a huge promotion. I was washing tractor trailer trucks overnight, counting potato chips out of a bag of potato chips so that it would last all year long, Hmm. or excuse me, all week long. Hmm. So what I'm saying is, is I was bankrupt emotionally, spiritually, I was bankrupt financially, I was bankrupt relationally. And this guy that I, is still one of my best friends to this day, David Hoyt, gave me a chance to start over again with John's company. I had had a little bit of leadership success, went through some really difficult challenges, um, and I found myself as a 30-year-old restarting in a telesales representative. But what happens, Cody, This is why I love doing what I'm doing right now. What happens is, is when you put yourself in an environment with like-minded people, people that are opportunistic, people that want to grow and learn together like this podcast family that I'm Mm -hmm. speaking to today, what happens? 
opportunity begins to open up. Advancement begins to happen. Higher horizons begin to appear simply because of the environment you put yourself in. And so nine promotions later, uh, because they kept trying to find something that I could do, with no business experience before John Maxwell, I was in a nonprofit community, with no business education, I went to a little small Christian college in Jackson, Mississippi, with no experience, no education, this environment gave me opportunity. And nine promotions later, I ended up as president and CEO in the year 2011. We've grown the company to five times larger than it was in 2011 when I took over CEO role. Now it's, it's an enterprise of seven multi-million dollar companies that I would say I run, but it, to be honest with you, runs me. <laughs> <laughs> well, and so talk about too now, yeah, I, I, this is pretty public, you know, or at least the people who follow you and have followed John, um, that, that you now own the, the company, right? That you've, you've been able to acquire that from John. Uh, John's still a very big part of, of the organization, but what, what's that like <laughs> taking yeah. over for someone who's such a, you know, iconic figure and anyone who's listened to this podcast at all knows my, uh, my admiration for John, right? I share a lot of the lessons I've learned from him on here, but what was that Maybe how scary was that to make this acquisition, but then also like, what's that been like to have to step into those shoes? Well, you've heard the gulp factor. Ooh, <laughs> is, are you are you really serious about this opportunity? I have that every day still. So that lets you know that I feel like I'm way over my head. Um, you know, what's interesting though, Cody, and I, I think this is really, as I've worked with you and John and Dave and the team this year at Advisors Excel, one of the things that I love about this community, and of course we have extended family too, you need to understand more about Advisors Excel, by the way, that is not a paid advertisement. I just love these people. One of the things I understand that I think will really relate is you get to a place of building a company to where it has to be bigger than you, but how do you make it bigger than you because you are it? Yep. And, and, and that's true with John Maxwell too. So the first thing I always have to answer when I say, what's it like to take the baton from John Maxwell and now own the companies that he started? It starts with the founder having a bigger picture, a bigger vision than him or herself. Don't miss that, all of you listening to this podcast. Some of you are considering succession. Some of you want to succeed. You want to work yourself out of a job. You've got to have a bigger vision than your benefit for it to work. So really, as successful, and we're having a lot of success here, as successful as this succession has happened, it starts with the person who founded it, the person who's leading it, the person who's grown it, being bigger than him or herself and seeing legacy and something bigger as the key objective. And too many successions, too many transitions doesn't work because the, the preceding leader, the founder, the current leader won't give up because they still want to be in charge and, and be the go-to. Well, so, and, yeah, yeah, I ask that because it's, um, in one, you know, you've shared some of this with our advisors, right? But we're sharing it with a little larger audience now. You said something, you know, we have a lot of advisors that are either like starting to think about it, maybe like actually actively, you know, planning a transition in their business or at least see it on the horizon. And one of the things I remember you saying is that you were going to create an organization that shifts from the founder to the foundation mm -hmm. and you would build on the legacy of John, but it's not going to be solely dependent upon John. And there's a few things I know that I was just going to ask you to speak about, because I think this is where where what you all have done can add so much value to so many people to listen to this is um, a lot of times the mistake I've seen some advisors make is they wake up one day and say, you know what, I'm ready to, to, to move on. And there's been no planning going into this. Right. Yep. So maybe talk about just um, what two things, what the thought process was that kind of went into this transition around just like planning and timeline and you've been with John for a long time and then yeah. one of the things you guys did at our leadership summit last year is you talked about this um I, I guess this kind of sit down that you and John would have where it's like every week it's like John would be telling you Mark here's the things that that you got to work on and you would tell John here's the things I need you to help me you know yeah. work on so if you'd maybe just talk through those like the the planning timeline and then second like how um you and John kind of 
you know, had this mutual mentoring relationship to make sure that it was a successful transition. You know, there's a whole lot to unpack here, Cody. Mm -hmm. And if I ever get some time and and away from owning and running businesses, I'm, I really am going to write a process, a book, a course around ex effective succession. But one of the first things that we did is I asked John, I remember he was leaving on a 10 day trip to Dubai and a couple of other places. And I said, John, when you come back, will you give me a list of things that you want to continue beyond your lifespan? Now we were just beginning to talk about um, succession then. We didn't have it clearly planned or articulated, but here's what we were trying to do that every leader needs to do. What are you doing now that needs to outlast you? That's good. I was with, incidentally, uh, two weeks ago, I was with the leader of Hobby Lobby, controversial company perhaps, but the billions of dollars of revenue that they have and the 50% of the bottom line that they donate and give away to worthy causes from their perspective is a remarkable business model, no debt. And he said that when he got out of debt about 25, 30 years ago and determined that he would never get back into it, he said, I made a decision that every leadership decision that I made going forward would be one that says, what would this decision matter to the people leading this company 70 years from now? Hmm. What I was basically asking John when we started that first list is I said, John, what are you doing right now that 70 years from now should continue in some way? He came up with 10 things when he came back from that comp from that meeting. We did not know that that would become the foundation of our 10 commandments of Maxwell Leadership Legacy, but it has become. And he listed 10 things. In those 10 things, we began to work and put processes, systems, strategies in place that each one of those 10 would have succession. We did not a tie we did not tie succession to a person first. We tied it to the concept of the legacy, thing, the things that needed to last in the legacy. And too often, we pick a successor before we define succession. And every organization, from those of you that have an incredible business, there's something unique about you and your business that needs to be identified as worthy of succession before you begin to groom the successor, before you begin to pick the successor. So define succession. What needs to succeed? Number two, let's now talk about picking a successor. And I think the biggest thing that John says that he picked first was a person that has his heart, not his skills. Yep. Because in succession, trust me on this, Succession is all about significance because when you start distilling down what needs to outlast you, you pull out your benefits, your trips, your cars, your houses, you pull out all of that and you start looking at the core components that will begin to define significance of your legacy of your organization. You define the significant aspects, now you better attract a heart that will capture that. And so, John began to find somebody that thought like him, believed like him, at the core was like him. I don't have anywhere near the same skills that he has, but we then began to cultivate the heart within me so that the heart would drive the legacy transition from his ownership to my ownership. Then, Cody, and this is what you were talking about at the incredible fun event that we did in Nashville with you, and that is we, we then identified the 10 things I would need from John to succeed him. And he identified the 10 characteristics, attributes that I would need for him to feel comfortable with me succeeding him. Yep. It was John's needs, my needs. And then finally, we can dig into all of this, but I don't want to belabor the point. We then identified five areas that I personally had to get better at if I was going to lead. We called them our five five lap relay. And we're still in the middle of lap number four, which we're not going to hand the baton off fully until John feels like I am running at the stride with which he was running, or I have picked up the pace of the stride he was running when he was running the lap. The first one, I'll give you one, there's five, yeah. but I'll give you one. The first one was leadership. Could I lead a company as good or better than John Maxwell? 
I started in 2010 as the CEO. It wasn't in 2000, until about 2017 when he looked at me and he went, you're running this company better than me. I'm out. I'm not making any more leadership decisions. We had not started succession at that point, but we recognized that a key component of John Maxwell's legacy was could I run a company better than him? We're in a fun little particular um, time of transition in, in a couple of par parts of our business and some of the, the uh, seven entities that we have. And yesterday, John called me. I'm, I'm making some pretty tough decisions. We were talking about this before we started yeah. recording, Cody. John called me yesterday and went, Mark, I would have never made that decision like you did. I'm so proud of you. You're making it better than me. Well, hmm. this is a hard week for me, Cody. And hmm. then to have John call and say, hey, man, I'm the leadership expert, but you're leading better than me, kind of made me square my shoulders and say, cool. I'm doing all right. So, so there's four of these laps that we have discovered that I've got to run at pace with John or outpace what he's done in the past uh, years of him running that lap. One thing I've witnessed that it's um, you you just what you said just triggered this thought in my mind, and maybe you can even talk to how important this has been. Um, so, so at some of the events that I've been with uh, you and John at, what I've I, I always listen to what you two say, but I also like to watch, um, especially with this, like I watch what John does, and one of the things I've watched him do, and I think this is just for you know other uh, founders, owners as they're thinking this through, and and um, you know succession or, or developing someone to eventually take over watching him build up your credibility in front of the audiences and transfer um, transfer his authority to you is fascinating to watch every single time, right? I, I just watch him do it. And the first time I heard him do it, I'm like, that was good. And then I start paying attention. And every time he goes out of his way to build up your authority, build up your credibility and try and transfer some of that. And, and I only say that because even, you know, if you think about the advisors that have been the face of their organization, you know, I think a lot of times they don't think about, you know, if I'm going to bring, you know, up maybe a junior advisor that eventually is going to take this over, how do I start transferring this authority and credibility to them? And, and what you said is like John calling you, you know, in a week that's been a, a tough week and saying like, man, you're doing a great job. I just watch him affirm you over and over and over again. Maybe just talk to like, I, I don't know if you have to say how that makes you feel, but just how important that has been in everything also. We've talked a lot. You, you probably have tackled this subject and I need to listen to you teach, but we've heard a lot of people talk about borrowed belief, right? You need to borrow belief. And, and, and you asked me, how do I feel uh, running John's organization and then owning John's organization? This is, this is an iconic leadership brand that John has created with his years of impact. And I am the leader for that. The dawning of that reality <laughs> struck me many years ago, way before I became owner. And I went, wow, I've got to borrow somebody else's belief. And so this idea of borrowed belief is something that we all do, whether we've heard the concept or not. And that is, I'm trying something so big that I need somebody around me who will allow me to borrow their belief in me and why they even gave this opportunity. But borrowed belief is not just for the person, the successor. Borrowed belief is for your network, too, mm -hmm. if you are the one that is being succeeded. And what John has done is exactly what you said, Cody. He has looked every opportunity to establish my credibility. We call it my believability with the people in his sphere of influence. You mentioned founder to foundation. One of our other rallying cries is to go from, uh, from persona to philosophy. What is the personality and what is the philosophy of the personality? And we're trying to sustain the foundation of John, not the foundership of John. We're mm -hmm. trying to sustain the philosophy of John, not the persona of John. Well, one of that has required, because so many people have gravitated to John because of one of his strengths. And Strengths Finder, man, his woo is off the chart. 
I do not have, I'm a decent extroverted guy. I, I'd like to go on vacation. I'd like to go see the Kansas City Royals with you and your kids, man. I, I, I could do that. We'd have a great time. I've got, I'm okay. But they're, they're, pretty no- bad. they're pretty bad this year. We should probably go see the Braves. You know. <laughs> Let's go. Let's just do something together. But John's woo, you would care less if there was a baseball going, game going yep. on. I've, I've been to a lot of sporting events that we never left the snack bar. Because John was the better show than the entertainment. My point is, John is followed, and perhaps some of you leading your 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 companies, you created the book of business, not just because you were darn good at your trade, but because you were so good at woo. Well, when somebody is succeeding somebody where one of their top characteristics, one of their top strengths is woo, and they don't have a top five woo, you really got to Hmm. overplay the believability of the person who's taken it. And John has done that, and it's made me square my shoulders and take on bigger challenges than I ever thought, certainly. But it's given people a chance to, to believe in me when I wasn't quite ready to be believed Mm -hmm. upon. Let me explain. John teaches this all the time. Cody, I've heard you allude to this. When somebody that's working with you, forget succession for a moment, but when somebody is working with you, for you, on your team, and they can do a task that you should not be doing, 80% as good as you, you need to transfer it at that point. Don't wait till they're 100%. Well, trust me, John started making me believable when I was at best 80%. (laughs) So what he was doing is is he was giving me time to become 100% to where truly our board and some of the communications that I've given on our nonprofit lately have went, we never got this communication with John. Thank you. But there was a 20% period that John had to make me believable while I went, and he overplayed that, but thank God that he did. That's good. And and you just, I mean, even as you were talking about John's woo factor, and I've witnessed it right i mean it's i've told people before when he's talking to you you feel like nobody else is even around um but so many of our advisors that you just explained them right Uh, so many of them especially that first generation they've just got this personality you know and they're so good at what they've done that trying to bring that person along that that may not have that but you know maybe has some other strengths maybe a little more process driven um, it, so I hope everyone hears that as you're thinking about that, like, how are you, you know, affirming and bringing those people along and giving them that believability factor. And Cody, let me, I, I do not want to interrupt you because I want to go where you want to go, no. but let, let me make one more point on that. All of you founders, be easy on a second generation. And here's what I mean. I'm imploring of you. Mm-hmm. People liked John when he wasn't that good because of his woo. And I would dare say to some of you advisors, people liked you before you really knew your financial acumen because of your woo. Well, I don't have that woo, but I have the systems and processes that I prove I can take it to the next place. So how you built the business is different than how I'm going to expand the business. So when you are handing that baton, don't hand the baton with a formula of how you did it. Hand the baton with a formula of how you would do it if you were me. And what I love about John is John's never put his woo ability on me. He has always, Cody, go back to the times to where you've heard him affirm me and you're going, okay, what's he talking about? He always affirms me in the way I do it, not the way that I emulate what he did and how he did it. And too many times we think the successor is the perfect person when they will do it or can do it or should do it the way that we did it. That is not good succession. And it's not good borrowed belief. If John would have started putting his way of doing things on me and celebrating the way that I did it like he did it, I would have never been able to live up to that expectation. That's really good. Uh, Let me ask you another question like succession question. And and I wasn't, this was not, I didn't prep you for this at all. Right. So you haven't seen this question, but you were just, there was something that triggered in my mind. And I'm actually having this conversation with one of our advisors later today. And I've, I've heard John talk about this. I think at one of the exchange events, um, a lot of the advisors we work with, the succession plan is a family member. Mm -hmm. And, um, sometimes those family members are qualified to be the successor 
and sometimes they're not, but oftentimes, even if they're not, they are the succession plan. How, is there anything you've seen where you have to um, have some clear expectations for that person coming in? And maybe especially if it's family, right? Of here's the things that you have to do as the successor coming in to like earn this right or any advice you would give advisors or any business owner that maybe has a family transition, but maybe they're a little nervous about are, are the family members really going to be able to carry this on? Yeah, wear two hats. That's the best advice I can give you, and I'll explain that, but just yep. jot that down right now. Wear two hats. And before I explain two hats, let me explain something to you. How good of a parent are we if we put our loved one into something that they never could do, never should do? How, how good of a parent are we if we set people up to fail? And I know, I know, I, I'll tell you a quick funny story and I'll get to the two hats. My daughter, Macy, is just the highlight of my life. She's got probably as much, if not more, drive than I do. She's so competitive. She's a great leader. Um, and, and she wants to hide behind a, a microscope and, and cure incurable, currently noted incurable diseases with her intelligence. So we're going next uh, Friday, I think, to Emory University for a college visit. I mean, she's just got high aspirations. And, and I look at that and I go, oh, gosh, man, what could <laughs> she do if she took over this business? Going back to 14, she's, she'll be 17 in a couple of weeks. Going back to 14, I think it was, maybe 13, she was doing all of this success and being recognized by her school. And, and so John and her have this great relationship. She said, he said, Macy, would you hurry up and turn 19 where you can take over your, your dad's job? And she said, why do I have to wait to 19? I'm ready now. And we just laughed for this little 13 year old telling John Maxwell, who's in demand that I can run your company at 13. What are you talking about? And my point in saying that is John and I were laughing, but we were like, man, would that be possible? She has no desire for that. And and I'm thankful that we can help her with that, even though we think she has the skill sets mm -hmm. to do some great things. First thing I'll say to you is you need your people, your family, whoever your successor is, to demonstrate that they want it, that they need it, that it is their design in life, not trying to please you, not trying to satisfy you and not trying to be entitled by you. They need to show an insatiable hunger that they want to take it. More than somebody that would come in and get paid to take it, a family member needs to show more passion to take it than others. Hmm. More, I believe, I believe that as close as I am to John, I did not need to show as much hunger as, say, his son would have needed to take mm -hmm. the baton from John. I think a family member needs to show more. I saw, I'm going to butcher this quote, and if I would have, you and I would have talked, <laughs> maybe one day you'll invite me back and I'll get this quote right. But I heard a quote the other day that says, why do parents that their success was shaped in the difficulty of the journey, why do they spend years trying to take the difficulty out for their, for their kids to achieve. In other words, we spend all the time trying to protect our kids, what, the one thing that shaped our success. Mm -hmm. It's the adversity that shapes our success, yep. and yet we spend all of our life trying to take the adversity out for our loved ones. So two hats. I heard a story the other day, you perhaps have heard it too, it's a pretty common story where a owner of a, a, mo, a million dollar, a billion dollar company had an heir apparent, his son, that was taking over the company. And he kept getting complaints. This founder kept getting complaints saying, your son is not nice on the floor. And he had had multiple, multiple, multiple conversations with him. When you go out and meet the people, the people are what it's about. One particular day, he showed up unannounced to the company and he, as for his son, his son was down on the floor. He walked up to his son berating a $45,000 employee on the shop floor. A billion dollar company, he's berating a $45,000 employee. He walked his son up to the, the, um, to the office and he said, son, I've got two hats. 
and I'm getting ready to put on one, but, 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 but stay with me. I'll put on the other. Hat number one, I'm the owner of this company and you are fired. I will not let the company that I built with people whose backs are bent because of what they helped me do to build this company, I will never let them be spoken to the way that you just spoke to that $45,000 employee. You are fired. He said, now, I take off that hat and I put on my father hat. Son, I just heard you were fired. How can I help you? Hmm. The point is you can never diminish until you are out of the picture, the fact that you as a father, as a parent, you have to wear two hats if you're going to choose your family member as your heir apparent. And if you fail to use one of those hats at any time in the succession, you are setting that family member up for, up for failure. That's good. Great, great advice. I'm, I'm going to steal and use that this afternoon for my call. Good. So. good. <laughs> no, good. That's, hey, just, no. hey, just make it better. Just yes. make it better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll actually have a little time since I didn't prep you at all for that question. So I, I, it, that's incredible value. Uh, let, let me ask one just maybe final um, transition succession question. Now that you've had a few years into this transition, any big learnings or takeaways that you've had um, w with this Maxwell leadership transition? Yeah, forgive me for being internal in language. Uh, all of you listeners, Cody, you'll understand this because you're such a student of John. John wrote a book called Five Levels of Leadership. Level one is the position level. People follow you because of your position. Level two is the permission level. People follow you because of what you've done for them. Level three, I'm not going to teach you all of them, but level three is the production level. And that's the level where people follow you because of what you've done for the organization. Cody, for all of my life, I've been a people pleaser. My life has been about serving others, people, people oriented. John's too. I mean, we're people oriented. Yep. So when I learned the lesson as CEO that I needed to gain respect based on my leadership, not on my popularity, it was an 18 month mentoring session that John took me on to help me understand that being productive is more important than being popular the higher the level of leadership that you climb. And I love that and I appreciate that. I want to be popular, but there's sometimes that there is a 90 to one vote and the one is the top leader and because they can see more and before, they have to go with the one against 90 vote. I had to learn that. What I did not know, Cody, and, and I, I'm embarrassed in some ways, but excited in other ways to share with people, is I knew that every time you had a position advancement, I've had nine before the 10th one being owner, that you went back to level one, the position level. People now respect you. Even though you were level three, four, five before, they now respect you because of your new position because you got the title. Got that. Level two, they follow you because, man, are you making good people decisions in the organization? Cody, for three and a half years, I stymied. I paralyzed myself and stayed at level two because it was feeling good to be a level two people following me because of what I did for them. And recently I woke up and went, hmm. I have not gained respect for what I can do for this organization yet. And I, and I, in some ways I wish I would have learned that sooner In other ways, I'm so glad I'm learning it now because the price of that lesson will guide me for the rest of my leadership journey. So I, I, that is a big one though, is I went back to level one and forgot to move from level that's, two and gain good. respect for um, that, what I've done for the organization. Yeah, I, I wrote that down. Every time you change a position, it's gonna take you back, right? Then you have to prove yep. yourself. Maybe talk, I don't know if this is a good place to ask this question. I, I know we said we weren't even sure we'd hit it, but it probably ties into what you just shared there. And I, you referenced earlier, it had been kind of a tough week, you know, and John had called you and said you did a good job. Maybe talk about just what that was, because I think that was that example of level three leadership. And then I know there's a pretty important, powerful lesson that you shared with me in that even before we started recording. Yeah. So, so you know, um, I, I, we had to eliminate some roles this week. That's what I've been alluding to. Um, and for an organization where I'm not kidding with you, our KPIs and some of the 
final parts of our buyer's journey has never been stronger. Some of our business models have never produced better, and yet we were wasting resources, both financial and human and creative creativity resources, on some underperforming to non-performing initiatives. And, and Cody, it's taking me months mm -hmm. to eliminate these roles, eliminate these plans, and eliminate the lack of progress in the organization. And I was really struggling with it. John, I know we're not producing. I know we're not, the people, some of the people are not performing. And I know that some of the plans are not delivering, but I can't do it. He taught me an incredible lesson, Cody, and this is what I'll give you and your listeners. Yeah, it was good. <laughs> when we as leaders inherit somebody else's people, plan, or pro production, it's really easy to look at that and say, that's not producing, get rid of that. That's not a good plan. Shut that down. That people, that person is not good. Get rid of that. And we just, we come in here like the big bad cowboy from the wild, wild west, and we can do it. However, when it's our hire, when it's our plan, and when it's our lack of production, we slow down. Now, I thought that was just me, and then John told me of a story of an organization he took over ownership of, and he began to identify that, man, in three years, I'm going to have to let all 100% of these people go. And so he built a plan, first year, the third, 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 and by the year, by three years, he was going to have, and he did have a whole new team. He said, but about three months in, he made a hire of somebody he had always wanted to work alongside to come in and be a lieutenant for him. And he said, Mark, it took me 18 months to transition that person out. And I went, touchdown. One of the greatest leaders in the world, it took him a long time. But here's the moral of the story, gang. When you're letting somebody else's people go, it gets easy. When you're letting somebody else's plans go, it gets easy. When you're letting somebody else's lack of performance be addressed and, and, and dealt with, it's easy. But when it's your lack of progress, you want to prop it up just a little bit longer. When it's your person, you want to give them just a little bit more time to improve. When it's your plan, you want to extend the time to see if it will work a little bit longer. And I discovered about three months ago that I was paralyzing the, the obvious ability to succeed that's in this organization that's decades old by the fact that my plans were stymieing with my inability mm. to act. And yeah. so don't delay just because it's your plan, your person, your progress. If it's not producing, deal with it. <laughs> There's my advice. Cody. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was so good. We were talking about it earlier and you just see, I mean, I've seen it in our own business, right? You, It's very easy to fall in love with your ideas um, yep. and, and not address them. Okay, let's transition a bit to uh, just, I want to talk leadership, obviously. It's what the space you've been in for 25 plus years right now. Um, you... You know, I think one of the things that's really interesting about what, what you do and what the organization does is you literally speak to leaders from all over the country every day, basically. What, it maybe just a set today, like what are some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing, the leaders that you all are supporting, working with, um, in front of, what are some of the biggest challenges they're facing today? And then maybe just any advice on overcoming some of those. Yeah, and, and, it, and I would be interested. I wish this was open forum, a Zoom call, and all of our podcast listeners could talk back to us because your advisors are going to know this better than me or mm. as good as me because I do talk to some senior leaders. The emotional capacity, the emotional tenacity of leadership has radically changed in the last three and a half years. Mm. I don't know if it was we tried to protect ourselves from a pandemic. I don't know if it's because we went home and forgot how to deal with people, but here's what I know. I don't talk to a leader anymore that is not emotionally challenged in how to lead or how to be decisive or how people's going to handle a very clear, distinct leadership voice. They're asking it. I mean, we saw, what was it, I think 1,700 Top CEOs of Fortune 5,000 yeah. companies exited in 18 months. We saw in the month of November 2021, the great resignation, we saw 4.5 million organization, uh, 4.5 million people resign from a secure job. A, a friend of mine, Sarah Brady, she did a survey in, in January of 2022 because of the great resignation in November that happened. 82% 
of the people said, I would leave my company today because of my leader if I could. 82%, Cody. So when you ask, I, I think that the emotional instability that we now see in leaders, leaders don't know how to stand up and take a point of view on anything anymore. Call it social media challenges, call it COVID, call it whatever. The state of leadership now is very unstable. So when you ask me what are leaders saying, mostly they're saying, do I have what it takes to lead? The, the world around me has changed so much that do I have what it takes is a big question that we're seeing. And I, and I would tell you to the advisors, to us, to you and I, and trying to serve people that are on the front line dealing with people, I believe people need, as we said during COVID, people need to be heard. You know, leaders often listen to respond rather than listening to understand. And I think we as leaders got to do a more intentional job of listening to understand. Because if we're going to lead people from where they are to where we want them to go or where they need to go, you're going to have to help them feel understood of where they are so they can feel emotionally stable to go where they need to go. And as leaders, we listen, we learn, We love and we lead, right? A lot of people have taught that. Listen, learn, love, lead. Listen, learn, love, lead. Man, that listening is all about understanding, not about hearing. It's not about checking the list so we can make you feel heard, so we can be heard. It's about understanding so we can take people on a journey. Max Dupree says this. John said it often. Cody, I'm sure you've heard it. Leadership is about disappointing people at the pace they can stand. And if leadership is about disappointing people at the pace they can stand, I can tell you this, their disappointment quotient, their disappointment threshold has shrunk. Mm. People are disappointed every turn, every day. They're disappointed because you're making them come into work. They're disappointed because they're not getting a return. They're disappointed at a pace that is alarming. So if leadership is about disappointing people at the pace they can stand and they are quick to be disappointed, we're going to have to do a better understanding to be able to take them on the journey we want them to go. You, you used the word pace, and you used that earlier when you talked about um, you know this transition with John and having to, to keep at a pace. How important is pace to leadership? I believe, so we talk about the art of leadership often. So there's a science of leadership. You got to care for people. You got to have the meeting before the meetings. I mean, John gives us a list in every book of the science of leadership. Mm -hmm. I believe pace speaks to the art of leadership. It's being able to understand where somebody is. It's being able to attach where they want to be with where they're going and what tools do they currently have and what tools do they need to take the mile marker journey to get there. We spend too much time as leaders talking about the destination than the journey. And I think that comes in the art of leadership. So my pace, which I'm highly intense, you can tell even with how often I lean up on this podcast. I'm just this passionate person. It's one of my top three values is passion. And, And what I have found is when I take people at my pace, because that's how I did it and that's how quickly I did it, I lose more people than when I go at their pace and they can get there. Now, the reason pace is an art is because you have to defy impatience that's in most all of us type A leaders. You've got to do things that are unnatural so that people can go at a pace they can handle and get to a place that they have hoped for but don't even believe is possible. So seeing it, because we see more and before, right, as leaders. But taking them on a pace that does not discourage them along the way is the art of leadership. Is there a point where th- that pace has to more closely match yours? It does, but they, they determine that. Okay. When I deal with pace and I tell somebody, so mentoring is a, is a key example, and this yep. is not a tangent. I promise I'm going somewhere. Mm-hmm. When I mentor somebody, and I try to mentor five people a year for no cost, because I've been given so much in mentorship that I feel like it's a way to pay it forward. So I get 100, 200, 300 requests to be mentored every year, and I take five that are pro bono, and I take them on a journey. 
One of the things that I talk about in mentorship is I will mentor you two sessions. The first session is to give you what I know for what you need today. The second session is to see if you did anything with it. Now, if you did something with it, we'll have a third session. If we did something with that third session, we'll do something for the fourth session. So when we're now talking about the pace of taking people on the way, they determine the pace, but pace is determined as successful by progress, not by accomplishment. Because the pace says that we've got to be seeing progress not that you have to accomplish it the way that I would accomplish it at the time I would accomplish it to the extent that I would have accomplished that same task. Mm -hmm. It's did you make progress enough that I can challenge you to a little bit more progress and a little bit quicker of a pace the next, the next assignment. John says again, one more time to quote him, you don't have to earn my love. I love everybody. I got a 10 on everybody's head, but you do have to earn my time. And pace is determined by the other person, and I give you more time based on progress at your pace to the last assignment. That's good. No, I, I, I've seen that with you and John. I, I watch the pace, and I watch how the team does seem to keep it. So I wondered how you're how you're getting them to that pace. So great, great um, response there. Okay, what I want to ask one kind of final question around just tough conversations because I know you had some of those this week, and so it's it's. One of the things that I see a lot of times when I'm talking to our advisors, especially when you're in a smaller business, right, where you may have five, six, seven employees, a lot of times they start to feel like family members. A lot of times they may be family members. Um, so I think sometimes they, they avoid or put off having tough conversations that need to be had. Just any advice you would have on how to help people have those tough conversations, because no, nobody loves having them, right? So just any no. thoughts or tips you have on that? Yeah, one thing that I have to, again, remember, I'm a recovering people pleaser. That's going to sway my talk. One of the things that I have to do when I'm making a the, the more difficult a transition, the, more, the harder I think it's going to be received, the greater I have to make sure that this decision is best for the person that I am leading. Now, they don't have to agree with that. They, don't ha they can believe that I'm blowing smoke. They can cuss me out. They can do all that. But I've got to fundamentally believe that I am not making an organization decision. I am making a people decision. And if I leave this person underperforming in this role much longer, they will completely lose all reputation and credibility. And so I have to go and make the decision that says, if I left you on this team, then I would make you feel inadequate because you're in a role that is not getting the best with you. I have to make that decision. This particular week was even harder than that because it is an organizational decision and the roles needed to be eliminated, mm -hmm. which captured people in the middle of that transition. But I had to make the decision, the roles needed to be eliminated so that we would be able to impact people for many years to come. It still was a people decision that had to ground me. That's not everybody. Some people can make bottom line decisions. They can make planned decisions. I have to make it from a people perspective. However you make the decision, get grounded that this transition is best for the way you make decisions. I make them from a people perspective. Once I do that, Cody, I come in and I give them in 30 seconds, they know the net net result of this meeting. I don't ask about your mom. I don't ask about anybody. I don't talk about your kids. Nope. This meeting is a difficult meeting, and it's a difficult meeting because today is going to be a transition day for you. Now, they may hear five more sentences. They may hear the <laughs> next five minutes. They may hear everything I have left to say. But I want to make sure that I communicate the challenge at the beginning so that then we can go from there. The second thing that I do is I always give them a perspective for them to embrace before I tell them, oh, this was so hard for me. Oh, I wrestled with this forever. That sounds like wah, wah, wah to somebody that just heard that. So my very first two to three minutes after that is why I hope this will be best for them in the long run. That sometimes sounds like wah, 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 too. But if I walk in and say, this is going to be a difficult day, 
you're, you're going to be transitioned. And by the way, I have struggled with this. I didn't sleep last night. I'm telling you, I threw up my breakfast this morning thinking about this. Oh, man, you are so tone deaf with what's being go- going on. So uh, make sure that it stays, make the decision, making sure that it stays in your filter of decision making. Make sure that you communicate quickly the gravity of what you're trying to communicate and then begin to go back and give them some reinforcement in things that you've observed or things that you hope for for them. That's really good. No, I appreciate you adding that. And sure, those were tough ones this week, but I, I love that because I've seen, I've watched even as people are new to a leadership role, like you him haw and beat around the bush forever trying to get the words out versus just, hey, hit it, hit yeah. them with it right away. So, um, Thank you for that. Okay, I want to ask you a couple lightning round questions. I know uh, I've had you on here for a while now. So this first one, I, I, I probably kind of asked this before, but I'll, I'll ask it again maybe a little separate way because you may have a little different answer. Um, you know, going back, I've said kind of going back to COVID, I think it, it's made everyone a leadership role just maybe learn a new lesson or new lessons. But is there one lesson that you've learned over the past few years that you think you'll carry forward for the rest of your life? Yeah, it, it really is that as an owner, as the senior leader, you really do have to focus on the production of the organization. Mm-hmm. And people decisions should filter from a place of organizational health. And uh, the importance of that as a leader is something that I've learned that I will carry forward with. I mean, it's a new lesson. I'm still learning it. I'm still mm-hmm. applying it, but it, it is a significant lesson. And all you business owners out there, you, you get that and you're like, well, finally you learned it, Mark. Of course <laughs> that. But for me, it was very important to understand the organizational health is, is a key determiner of my leadership. Yeah, I think as we were talking before, you know, I'm probably a people pleaser also. So so having to prioritize that over, you know, being the people pleaser is a, uh-huh. it's a tough thing to do, but it's critical. And, you know, if leadership was easy, everyone would do it, right? So, so sometimes right. you have to make the tough decisions. Okay, uh, second question. What is the one thing, as you look back, that you did that, that graduated you from being a good leader to a great leader? Yeah, you know, so for me, it was absolutely the focus on personal growth. I have got to have the gravitas from the inside out. Mm-hmm. I can have all the accolades, but if I don't come from a source, from a place, from a strength of leadership within, then my shelf life, my sustainability is non-existent. So it's the importance of leadership from within. And I focus every single year, every single week, every single day on something that will grow me from the inside out. Well, so that's a great transition question. I, I love that answer. It would be how I would answer that. But uh, the third question I always like to ask, is there something you're doing for your own personal growth this year that has you excited? Yeah, so this year, uh, my word for the year is better. And so every decision that I make on both the personal side and the professional side is, will this make me better? I just got back. We love to talk about kid stuff. I just got back from an eight day experience with my daughter. She's 16, she's a rising senior. And we went to this camp called JH Ranch in California. And I'm telling you today, I am soaring because I carved out, I didn't check cell phones, I didn't do that. And I had a big week coming up the next week. We talked about that. I went and focused 100% on my daughter and I can tell you, I am better today because I focused on better every single week and I am a better dad because of what I did two weeks ago. That's good. Um, I, I like that a lot. Uh, okay, fourth question. What is a the one book? Okay, that's, let me put a caveat on this. Let's say we can't recommend one of John's, okay? So, okay. So, okay. But what is the one book that you've recommended most to other uh, leaders, entrepreneurs, business owners? Yeah, so I, the, the book that I am referencing like crazy right now, I just did a podcast with her um, as well, Uh, is Juliet Funt wrote a book called A Minute to Think. And it is talking about creating a wedge in every calendar break so that you are mentally, emotionally, and uh, uh, leadership-wise ready for the next meeting. And it has got some practical tools. So A Minute to Think by Juliet Funt. That's a great one. Uh, I ordered that off Amazon the other day when you mentioned it on our, our mentoring call. Okay, final question best piece of advice that you've ever received? So I I really, it comes back to, again, I've said this, alluded to this a couple of times about my passion for relationship for people, but life, 
leadership and legacy is about others. Life is about others. Leadership is about others. Legacy is about others. And if we can, if we can put into our context that our leadership, I love this. I love this quote. I don't even know who to attribute it to, except for one trivial exception. Life is all about others. Hmm. And so it's this concept that the better legacy that we have, the more leadership that we exhibit, the, the more fulfilled life that we have, it's because we're doing it with others. We're pouring and adding value to others. Well, Mark, you're doing that in a big way. So I appreciate you not only taking the time today to join, but just uh, all the value you've added to our organization over the past, you know, from more than 12 months now. It's 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 uh, been a journey and it's been a lot of fun to have you at some of our key events, but also the monthly mentoring calls that you've been doing. Uh, for those who want to stay in touch with you, kind of follow along on this journey you're on, what's the best way for them to stay connected to you? So two ways, you can go to maxwellleadership.com. Our podcast is there. John does a daily minute with Maxwell, piece of encouragement. And we, of course, produce and are part of that at times. Uh, you can also download on Android or iPhone. Uh, you can download the Maxwell Leadership app. And uh, there's a bunch of free resources there that you can do. Our podcast is there. So either one of those, if you want to do it digitally, Maxwell Podcast, uh, our Maxwell app, and then uh, you can go to Maxwell uh, leadership.com. So yeah, so much great content out there. Everyone should do that. And you know, one of the things I say all the time at the end is we, we need more great leaders. It's why I was so excited to have you on here today to help all of us become better. So Mark, again, thank you for everyone listening. Go be great.